So I'm really pleased now to be joined by uh, Professor Otavio Alfieri, a, a real giant in the field. Thank you so much, uh, Otavio, for joining me. Yeah, and you are a giant in the field and have been for a while. Yeah, you are, you are. Um, the, let me ask you, you were uh, involved um, intimately in the, in the writing of the new ESC, EACTS guidelines for valvular heart disease. How did that come about? You know, these uh, uh, new guidelines uh, are uh, an official uh, document uh, of uh, both societies, the European Society of Cardiology and the European Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery. And this is the first time that the guidelines have been uh, prepared and written by both societies. So I think this is a very important point right. to start with. I mean, it's almost like the heart team model writing, exactly. writing the guidelines. Exactly. Um, uh, the previous guidelines uh, have been written in uh, 2007. And many things uh, changing during these five years. And certainly the heart team approach uh, has been introduced in our clinical practice. And I think that uh, throughout the guidelines, uh, the heart team concept uh, is a kind of protagonist. And uh, in the guidelines, the heart team approach uh, has been suggested for uh, many decision-making processes. In, uh, and, and as you, you and I were talking earlier, and you, you emphasize there have been so many developments in diagnosis and actually in therapy. So that's also been included in the guidelines to some Certainly extent? Certainly in the new guidelines, of course, we, we took into consideration the, the progress that uh, occurred during these uh, five years. And certainly the diagnostic, um, uh, diagnostic methods have been changing a lot. Certainly new technology in imaging uh, took place and uh, this uh, has, uh, taken, has been taken into consideration the guidelines. In addition, the risk assessment and the risk stratification of patients was something that was right. ignored before. Right. Right. And uh, now we have uh, scores to judge exactly about the risk uh, of surgery for the patients. And the, the last thing I think is very important is that uh, new therapies uh, have been proposed uh, for the valves. Certainly, there was a lot of progress in valve repair right. for the mitral valve, and this, of course, has to be recognized. But also, uh, new technology uh, are emerging, like uh, percutaneous uh, mitral valve repair with the edge-to-edge -edge technique. And of course, for the first time, this type of therapies uh, have been taken into account. And uh, certainly, the guidelines suggest uh, in uh, selected cases uh, the percutaneous approach. You, you're, you're touching upon some uh, the, sort of the next thing I wanted to ask you specifically how do the guidelines address or what's new in, let's say, mitral valve repair? Is it through the introduction? Through the, um... in, the, in the mitral valve repair, certainly. Um, uh, the guidelines put a lot of emphasis uh, on the opportunity of mitral valve repair in the vast majority of patients with mitral valve uh, regurgitation. Um, uh, just because uh, it has been recognized that mitral valve repair is associated with uh, lower mortality, lower morbidity, better long-term results, uh, and certainly better preservation of the left ventricular function and um, uh, avoidance of uh, uh, prosthesis-related problems. So really addressing the concept of repair. Let me ask you, speaking of repair, are, an, are enough repairs being done on the appropriate people in Europe, or is there still room for improvement? I know there's a lot of room in the States for improvement. Of course, there's a lot of room of improvement. Uh, I have some data, for instance, uh, uh, from the database in England. You know, the, uh, the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery in Great Britain and Ireland has uh, produced a uh, database uh, uh, documents. And uh, in, in, uh, in England, uh, the uh, repair rate is uh, about 67%. There are centers, however, who have a repair rate close to 90% and others who have a repair rate of zero. So, no, so you know, 90 and zero. Oh, 90 and zero. So it's, it's a tremendous difference. Of course, uh, you have to take into consideration also the type of valve and the, the referral. 
but certainly it's the attitude of the surgeon which is different from center to center. So there's a lot of space for improvement, particularly in the dis dissemination of the practice of mitral valve repair. So, so to some extent, then, a meeting like this, which we just heard the applause, a meeting like this plays a critical part of that, doesn't it? Certainly, because a meeting like that uh, is, is probably this is really the best meeting in the world, and uh, the best event in the world about uh, mitral valve disease. And uh, I think it's very important because it's disseminating the knowledge and the culture of mitral valve repair. That's fabulous. Well, as I said, I really appreciate you're visiting with us today, but most of all, your fabulous contributions to the field. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you.